and I've asked him today to talk about it because he knows it a lot more than me. But uh, I've got, we got started with this, Grace and I got started with this uh, in, um, we kicked off in uh, January 2020, so they're just over two years, just over two years old. Uh, and I actually went wider roads than most people because I wanted to be able to farm in between. And my objective was not just to do it for me, but I was just trying to see if it's possible to make it possible to farm <coughs> your land as well as have some topics. So I made it the rows like four rows with a, a, a mower apart or two runs with a header. So that you could grow a crop in between your centropic rows, still put all that carbon in the soil and still get good crops. So that was my, my plan and it seems to be panning out quite well. Um, but a lot of centropic rows are a lot closer, but that's the reason these rows are so wide. And you might be able to see a bear patch there, a couple of bear patches. The one there where, the, um, where there's three bales of hay and no grass, that was grass like this high, and it took the cows three days to eat it down, and I also said about seven, seven bales of hay in there while they were in there. So all the grass, all the hay, it all turned into shit, <laughs> Do they eat any of the stuff you don't want them to eat when they're well, in Well, I can show you something. But I've done some pruning with geese. I've done some pruning with cows. I've done some pruning with guinea pigs. Well, not guinea pigs, but they've done the weed control. Yep. But, yeah, the, the, the cow was, was unintentional. The, the um, electric fence shit itself. And I didn't know. And I was lucky I was there. And they only pruned the cow. So they defoliated some trees. But, yeah, and this other section though, where there is grass, they were in there for half a day, three days. Now I started on this other, oh, sorry, I started on this other run, other run here in, in where I had a, a multi-species pl planted crop, but the soil was too soft and they were compacting it too much, so I pulled them out, I didn't go ahead with it. So I only had one day in there, I said, bugger this, I'll get them out, and I'll put them back this way. So you'll be able to see that the green crop, that's, there's like three stages there. I actually grazed it with the geese and it came up and then I, um, then I grazed it with the cows. So the geese were first and the, the green that's there was about, was about three quarters of the height of what the first patch was. Because they, the, the geese did it in three stages as well. At the end, I pulled the geese out because the sun hemp was getting too coarse and too thick and they couldn't drop it. They used to chew the stalks off and drop it down to eat the leaves, but they couldn't do that anymore. So we've shifted them over to another grass cutting just over here. And we'll keep them there over this year now until they breed. We'll keep, that's their breeding pen, so we'll breed them there. So um, any other questions? Does anyone like to ask a quick question and then we'll hand over to Adam? John, what species of uh, eucalypt or whatever? Well, is it? I, I, I've actually used I, I've actually used uh, silky oaks as my, my trees. Uh, I got them cheap, cheap, a <laughs> reasonable price, and, and I thought, well, they're a good timber tree, and I'll see how they go. So, um, so I've used that in mulberries. Uh, so they have a big tall tree amongst that, and I've got avocado and all sorts of stuff in there. And I've actually tried to create a food forest, but if you want to grow a particular crop, you can probably grow that in a tropic system and grow crops in between and still keep liable to the farmer, you know. Alright, any other questions, quick? Well, I'll let the system. Oh. Any other species that are <coughs> used in this system? That, that's only been going two years. Yeah, I mean, in, in general, for some traffic, what are the species of eucalypt you would use for this approach? Oh, I don't know. Ask Adam that one. I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Adam. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. <Sorry>. Come closer. <laughs> don't be shy. I don't It's hot. Hot. <laughs> I can put you in a hotter place. You come up here and you can tell everybody. Right? <laughs> um... We've actually got some stewards here who've just finished uh, an eight-week course, and I actually thought one of them could probably come up here and uh, give a talk since it's fresh. So who could I choose? No, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> so let's just look at the word syntropic. It comes from syntropy. Syntropy and entropy. Now, if you look this up, you'll find all manners of descriptions of it, depending whether you're looking from a physical, chemical, or biological. So, the way we're looking at this, it's, it's a movement of direction. So, if you're going into syntropic direction or entropic direction, they're in opposite directions. But they are both needed. Syntropy and entropy have to be in balance. Like night and day, dark and light, they have to be in balance. You can't say, well, we're going to get rid of it all. So syntropy is a movement in direction where we're going from a simple system to a very complex system. We're increasing the diversity and therefore increasing life. Life creating life creating life. Entropy <coughs> is in the exact opposite direction. When we're heading towards death. But we need to have this. If you look at a tree, a tree, when it's growing, is a syntropic system. But when that tree comes down as either a biomass or is knocked down by a cyclone, it goes through entropy to become syntropy again. So, syntropic farming was created by a Swiss guy who moved to Brazil and is now teaching Australians how to use eucalypts. I think that's beautiful. <laughs> because most of the Australians I talk to, especially farmers, you mention eucalypts, they can't say anything, but it's a mongrel bastard. It's because we don't understand them. We don't understand most of the plants that we've been given on this planet. So Ernst Scotch, this Swiss guy, he learned how to mimic nature. He went in and he really studied it. And he also learned from the indigenous people in Brazil how they had farmed for thousands of years. So we're doing the same. We are relearning how to use everything that nature gives us to change our attitude. That bit of real estate real estate between your ears is the hardest thing to change. So when you look at this, what we're doing is, is here we're creating diversity. This before was just a grass paddock, or in this case it's a cover crop here, but it was just a grass paddock. It was close to being a desert. That's what we call entropy, where we're losing diversity, we're losing life. So how can we bring it back? By putting in these tree lines we're starting to bring life back in. So let's look at it how it starts. First of all, we have colonization. Then we have accumulation, which leads to abundance. We have to go through these processes of building a forest. Now this forest can be in a grassland too. When you've got the diversity of all those grasses, four small shrubs, big shrubs, it's not just grass. You need to have that diversity, especially if you've got grazing livestock. So we look at these trees and we can see this system here would have been very low in life when it first started. This is very old country here. Decomposed granite country can be up to 2 billion years old. If you're lucky, you're on the red soil. Those red soils would maybe 3 to 7 million years old. Geologically, that's a that's a. If you do holistic management, it will be kind of this ripple environment. It's very fragile. In order to build life on life, we actually have to start rolling. And what we do is we use pioneer species to bring that life to bit. Now, John wanted to create a food forest here, and so I said to him, the thing is, is that you haven't got much accumulation. You're still very much in a colonization stage. And we've just looked at a colonization stage where the cows are right now. All those plants that we call weeds are colonizers. They're not only colonizers, they're the forefathers of all the vegetables we eat now, which are now later successional plants. They're all playing a part, every single one of those. We watch them on our farm. We watch the progression as one weed is taken over by another by another. And if you actually learn what they're doing, you get to realize that each of them is playing multi-role in rebuilding. So this is really what we're doing here, is rebuilding the landscape as fast as possible. Well, nature doesn't work to our time frame. So what would happen is it might take a million years, but it doesn't care. But I know John wouldn't be too happy with that. I agree. <laughs>
So we, we've got to learn how can we rebuild these systems really fast. So we're talking about going to a full growth forest in a matter of maybe five, ten years, depending on where you are. So it's learning about what are the plants that we can put into these systems to build the colonizers. And they're known as the pioneers. So John's been using some here. So mulberry mm, sort of bounces in between being a colonizer and an accumulator. Silky oaks, I would have preferred to see eucalypts in here. Eucalypts are much faster growing in degraded systems, produce a lot more abundance. But John said he got a deal. <laughs> so he went along with that, and yes, they are timber trees. But generally they come in a little bit later. So those, are the, those trees start, and you can use also things like pigeon pea. So we're doing a bit of trial at the moment with tree crotalaria, which is a legume. Uh, senna, cassava, you saw a whole lot of Mexican sunflowers, lantana. You know, lantana is a fantastic accumulator. Of phosphorus, what's lacking in these environments? Calcium and phosphorus. That's why all the weeds are growing is because they work mostly with calcium and phosphorus. <coughs> you go along to, uh, have we got any salesmen here for a chemical company? <laughs> Can you come up and stand up here? <laughs> Anybody? No? They'll tell you the system is driven with potassium and nitrogen. If you use lots of potassium and nitrogen, you will encourage weeds, disease, and pests. What does nature use? Calcium and phosphorus. The big truck with a big engine to carry everything. So that's what we're, all these weeds are doing, is to re-establish the calcium and the phosphorus cycle. So once you start getting the system working, but if in John's case, I said if you want to grow things like vegetables, a food forest, then you're going to have to bring in the accumulation very quickly to build not only the area that cover crops growing on, which is going to be used for a horticultural, but also to build the tree roses fast as well. So when you've got your you've got your pioneers starting the system, they bring in life, they're creating space for the next guys to come in, what we call succession. So Syntropic is a agroforestry successional system. It's similar to permaculture, it's similar to many other things, but it's got differences as well. But they all work together. That's what I'd like to if, if take nothing home with you today, is the realization of what John was saying at the beginning. Biodynamics, syntropics, permaculture, organics, bioag, anything that's working with life, bio, is all working in the same direction. It depends on what works for you, where you live, what works for your, your thought way, anything. This was a way that John could see that he wanted to create a dream was, and one of his dreams was to create a food forest so he could feed lots of families, as well as do his farming. Now, I think all of us who get into the tropics have all got that vision. The realization, I'm sure you all start to realize now, how dependent we are of importing things in. So we need to be able to be resilient, we need to stop being importers and stop being creators. So once you start getting your system going, you've got your colonizers doing the job and starting to produce biomass that you keep putting back on the ground, now you're starting to accumulate. When you start to accumulate, you can then start to take later successional plants that need that accumulated of life in order for them to be able to grow. And all the vegetables that we eat now are not pioneers. If you want to eat the pioneer vegetables, go and eat weeds. All the vegetables that we eat are later successional plants, and they need a certain amount of accumulation before that they will thrive. I've seen a lot of vegetables growing in syntropic systems, and they're moth-eaten. And they're only trying to say, look, I'm no good. I need to be put back as biomass. So that leads me to the thing is, there is no such thing as competition in nature. Competition is an ego-based thought pattern. If you see two trees growing side by side, and one's doing really well and the other one's not, the tree that's not doing well accepts that it's not the best being to build that system. It's all about the end game. It's all about the good of the whole. And it will happily become the biomass that will feed the tree that is doing the best job. You bring the human in and we immediately start to compete. Here's why. 
ground cover at all times. So I know in permaculture they do a lot of earth moving. Uh, I'm not against that, but we're trying to get away from that because every time you're doing earth moving, you're disturbing a complete colony of beings. We're trying to keep away from that. We want to keep the ground covered at all times. The moment you do earth moving, you start to repair soil. Next one. Maximizing photosynthesis. This is absolutely, this is the pump that runs the planet. We get free energy every day from the sun. How do we capture that? Get me out of the sun. <laughs> we actually just get hot. We don't really, we get a certain amount of energy from that. Some say that humans do photosynthesize, but not the same as plants. All these plants are photosynthesizing. They're capturing sunlight and they're using that energy to convert that into sugar through a process. And that sugar is what feeds them, builds them, but most importantly is how they're pumping carbon into the soil. That carbon is sugar. That only, not only does it go into the stable carbon pool, but it also feeds all the microbes underground. And the plant and the microbes communicate and they actually live in this symbiotic relationship. Cation, which is to do with the layers within a forest. The layers in the forest are there for a very good reason. It's because it means that you can maximize photosynthesis. It means you're picking up light all the way to the ground. So you've got trees that are right out of the top, like the eucalypts, which are known as emergents. They love to be in full sun. Then you've got ones below that which we call highs, like bananas and avocados, things like that. They actually don't like to be in full sun. But we've played around with the breedings and we've made things to grow in full sun. But they're not actually in their happy place, they don't live that long. If you put them in the right space, they live a long time and are very productive. Then below that is the mediums, and then you've got the lows. And I mean, in permaculture they also talk about vines and they talk about fungi layers. So it's all part of the system where you're capturing sunlight. <laughs> so it's about light, not height. So if you've got a plant that will grow in the low zone, they're normally picking up the blues, blues and green lights. <clears throat> the spectrum of light that they can pick up and photosynthesize to their max. Right. Once we start building humus in our soil, we're starting to build resilience into the system. And here's what's going to happen when they've done their job. We have to have succession. We have to have something that's ready then to take the place of those guys who came before. It's the same with us. Our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids are all succeeding us. Hopefully we've created a space where they can thrive. And they create a space where their children thrive and, and it keeps going. So the same thing's happening here where these plants have created a space for the next generation of trees or plants or whatever. So they succeed them. They bring in what they bring in. And if you watch weeds, if you've ever studied weeds, the weeds will succeed. One weed will do a job, creates a bit more life. The next weed now, oh, I can grow in that space now. It grows, it creates a space for the next one. And the next thing you know is, suddenly, you're now up into later succession of plants like grasses, all those herbaceous plants that you can use for grazing. We've done this on our back paddock where we've used lantana to build a system. Four years is a lot of work, a huge amount of work. I won't beat around the bush on that at all. And in fact, a lot of us who got into it got overwhelmed by the amount we've created. But what happens is, as you create more life and more life in the system, you start to manage yourself out of it. And then you start harvesting. You harvest your nuts, your fruit, the timber, the fiber, the fodder. You start harvesting because now you've got the stage of abundance. And it keeps building more and more and more. It doesn't suddenly go, oh, I'm empty again, I've got to fill up. Which is where you go into if you're using chemical barley. You're constantly having to add more to the system and you're, you're leaking energy out of it the whole time. So that's basically it in a nutshell.